Hello and welcome back to Problem Solvers University. Um, I know it's late in the evening right now and most of you have been uh, putting in a full days of work. So I can promise you this. Tonight, you know, we won't spend... I, I try not to get long-winded. But uh, for all my newcomers, uh, let me do a quick in introduction. My name is Dr. Carlos Moore. A lot of my friends call me Big Los. Um, that's a picture of me that you're currently looking at. Um, I am a 21 year retired United States Air Force military man. Uh, they consider me a vet. Uh, I am originally from Tampa Bay, Florida. Um, graduated Tampa Bay Technical High School. Uh, go Titans. Uh, I want to send a shout out to a couple of my buddies. Uh, I spent time with why in the military, Jeffrey Hathaway, uh, Presley, Keith Anderson, Eggerston, congratulations on your uh, recent found uh, promotion, uh, Cherry Blossom Lodge 42. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Tez, uh, Bellinger, Art Bellinger, uh, Dolan Yates, uh, and to that's just to name a few. Uh, I give more shout outs to my comrades and on because we went through some things that a lot of people hadn't went through. And sometimes I just have this feeling that we have to uplift each other. Okay, that being said, let's move on. Armor of God. Now we hear this all the time. So, so what are we talking about? Uh, you know, the phrase full armor of God. It comes from the book of Ephesians. Paul wrote to the Ephesians. In chapter 6, verse 13 uh, through 17. Uh, now, a lot of people say there are six pieces of the armor, but actually it's seven pieces. Uh, let me tell you what this verse said, what Paul said. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of, day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand... Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now that's what I added. Um, prayer is the one that should have always been. See, if you look at that diagram inside that warrior's face shield, he's praying. You must pray all the time. You know, when you go to work and you got some enemies that uh, you work with your co-workers. They always talking about you. Just keep yourself in prayer meditate on some scripture And that's very important that you try to remember or memorize some scriptures so that you can always be praying See, because when you pray now you must remember you must be praying using the Word of God You know when Satan tried to tempt Jesus. He just didn't say any word. He actually quoted from the Word of God so you know, there's no magic word that you can think of that will defeat Satan. You have to use God's word to defeat Satan. Uh, so let's continue on. Satan's spiritual attack. Now, Satan always try to attack all of us, you know. Uh, it says on this slide, you know, fight with the right tools. See, the only tool I've learned to use to fight wars for me or my battles, I should say, is the word of God. Now, even though I'm a pretty big guy, uh, you'll be surprised how many people try to um, uh, attack me, you know, even physically. Uh, I have had people who, who they like to try, you know, um, for all my athletes out there, you know what I'm talking about. If you're on a basketball court, the smallest man on the court try to hurt you. Uh, big men, we usually know how to respect each other because if you know two big men together you know there's a common respect but sometimes we run into problems uh outside the physical realms into spiritual realms so you know and paul said in ephesians 6 12 that um 
you know, the conflict with God with Satan is spiritual. So therefore, you know, uh, no tangible weapons can uh, be effectively employed against him, you know, because his menu, which is uh, his fallen angels, um, they they do his fighting for him. So we're not given a list of specific tactics to defeat Satan. But um, however, we, you know, this passage is quite clear that when we follow God's instructions faithfully, we will be able to stand and we will have victory regardless of Satan's strategies. I always say like this here, <clears throat> God made us in his image. Therefore, the Bible, basically, the way I look at it, it's all instruction manual. Uh, when I, I bought a... Uh, uh, any item, appliance, for example, a refrigerator. Now, I could just plug the refrigerator in, but what if it had an ice maker? I forget how that I need to plug the tube into uh, the water faucet in the back of the refrigerator, and then I go get some ice and it's not working. See, I have to read the instruction book. I know a lot of men, if you're like me, we, we just kind of like look at the diagram and put it in action, right? <laughs> but, you know, that's all pride. Our pride sometimes makes us not want to look at instruction but for a christian it's impossible to live a christian lifestyle if you're not reading the instruction manual which is the word of god now while i'm saying the word of god i'm talking about the bible the bible uh is actually a collection of books called biblia and it has 66 collection of books put into or canonized into one book okay now Let's talk about the first piece of the armor of God. Um, it says, stand firm, then with the belt of truth, buckle firmly around your waist. Now, this looks familiar to all of us, right? This is the first element of our armor, uh, and it's called the truth. You know, um, this is uh, easy to understand since Satan is said to be a father of lies. So we must follow our father with his truth, right? Deception is high on the list of the things God considers to be abomination. You know, uh, lying tongue. You know, by the way, the tongue is the small, smallest organ um, on your body, but it's its most powerful one. And the reason why I say that, we can use that tongue to praise and bless people, and then we turn around nanoseconds, that, that's quick now, and we can curse that person out. We could defame that person. We can make that person uh, feel so little with that one organ. So even though it's little and it's encapsulated inside your lips, uh, it is very dangerous. So we must be cautious how we use that tongue. So what Paul is saying here is the lying tongue is one of the things that uh, God describes as detestable. You know, you can you can even look at Proverbs chapter six, uh, verse sixteen through seventeen. You know, so so what what should we do? Um, we should exalt. All, all fellow brothers and sisters, you know, and put the truth uh, of our own sanctification and deliverance over our lips. You see, imagine if you wake up every morning and say, I'm not going to say a negative thing out my mouth. You know, I'm be honest with you, I'm at the point right now, it's when negative people start talking to me, I really tell them, be quiet or I'll walk away. Because, see, I live such a great life based on what God has done for me that I don't like to hear all that negative stuff. I know there's a lot of racism going on. I know that uh, our federal government is not doing what I, I think they should do. But you know, in the end of the day, I'm gonna be laying horizontal in my casket. And I, you know, and let's say before that, let's say I'm somewhere in the hospital and I can get to reflect for a little while. And I say, man, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. So what I'm doing now is living out my bucket list. And my bucket list basically is to help my fellow man. So I hope that I can encourage you to do the same. So put on that belt of truth. Now the second piece is the breastplate of righteousness. You know, <clears throat> I was talking about your co-workers, you know, talking about you. It could be some relatives of yours, you know. See, it says with the breastplate plate of righteousness in place right so why do we wear a breastplate now police wear bulletproof vests we used to wear the military bulletproof vests but what is this actually saying the breastplate of righteousness well a breastplate shields a warrior vital organs from blows that would otherwise be fatal you see your heart is underneath that breastplate some of your other organs you know your you know you got your 
your ribs, your spine, uh, you know, um, so, so, um, you know, rather than fight with words and this breastplate uh, that God wants you to put on, this, look, look what it says. Righteousness is something God's give us as Christians, right? So we are not righteous on our own. So righteousness guard against direct attacks of our heart. Okay, on our hearts, you know. A lot of people use words to try to, now remember, we're talking about spiritual. We're not talking about physical. So that breath place of righteousness requires you to start reading your Bible. Okay, that's what that means. Because this righteousness that I'm talking about is not works of righteousness done by human men or women. Okay, rather, this is the righteousness of Christ imputed by God and received by faith, which guards our hearts as against the accusations and charges of Satan and secures our innermost being from attack. Do you not know that Satan goes to and fro from earth to heaven and his job is to accuse us? He, he tries to prosecute us in front of God. Jesus is our mediator. <clears throat> That's why he took his earthly man body back to heaven. And so he's now man God and sits on the right hand of God. So as Satan goes up and say, you know that Dr. Moore cat, he don't do right. You know, uh, look at him. He think he's all of that. But if you let me do this to him, you know, think back in Job. And then God said, okay, that's my warrior. Go ahead and try it. So that's why Satan, temp, Satan tempts us and God tests us. You see, God never tempts us. He allows Satan to tempt us and God tests us. Why did God do that? He's trying to make us pure diamond. He's trying to make us pure gold. And therefore, we have to be refined through the furnace of the fire. Otherwise, we'll remain baby Christian. We'll never mature without going through the tests and trials. We always say that. I'm going through, I'm, I'm being tested, baby. Or well, I'm going through some trials today. Well, rest assured, you're going to come out as pure gold. The third piece is the feet. <clears throat> now, in the, in the military, I wore what we call jungle boots. So I won't stump my toes when I walk through the uh, woods. In the desert, I wore these like... Uh, uh, they, it was soft type of material. I wouldn't really call them suede, but they, they was more like suede boots. I didn't have to worry about stumping my toes because that sand was hot. That suede actually keep your feet cool, you see. So, but anyway, what we're talking about here uh, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So what is this readiness? Ready to fight what we know is true, not physically now. That means spiritually. So how do we fight a spiritual fight? Well, once again, you got to read your Bible. Pick your Bible up, dust off the dust, open it, chapter one, Genesis, or open it, first book in New Testament, Matthew. But what I will suggest you do, you read one book at a time. Act as though you're taking each book, each one of those 66 books, and you're tearing them out the complete Bible so that you can read one book at a time. The worst mistake you can do when you're studying the Bible is to try to take a text, which is a verse, as we call it, a text and take it out of context to try to make a pretext to what you want to believe. You'll find that in a lot of church service today, the pastor may say, turn to this chapter, turn to this book, Turn to this verse. And before you know it, you went through 20 chapters and verses just so that that particular clergyman can put together his sermon. I don't really like that because I write a lot of books myself. You can find my books at lulu.com. I like my books and all the writers that I know. We like to keep a train of thought going. And so the authors of the Bible, which was over 40 authors, each author had a train of thought. Each author wrote their books at different times uh, in, in history, you know, and, and so we, 
I think we're doing the Bible injustice when we take a book that's written like in 40 uh, AD and try to put it back into 2000 BC. You see, it doesn't compute. You know, just like now we have technology uh, today. But if you go back when I was in school, there was no such thing as a cell phone. So if you tried to talk to me back in my day about a cell phone, I like I would be like, what are you talking about? And like when I talk to the young uh, people today about eight tracks, they said, what was that? See, so I'm trying to give you a clue. We have to use, uh, when we study the Bible, make sure we're studying the proper context, okay? Now, this preparation of feet is a spiritual conflict. So in warfare, sometimes the enemy places dangerous obstacles in the path of the advancing soldier, right? In the military, we call it IEDs, right? <clears throat> so the idea of preparation of the gospel of peace uh, as footwear suggests that we need to advance into Satan territories, but be aware that there are traps. So with the message of grace, which is always essential to winning souls to Christ, we must be careful when we go into Satan battlefield. Satan has many obstacles placed in a path to hold the propagation of the gospel. That is why when you start speaking about Jesus Christ, a lot of trouble comes your way. See, because Satan trying to throw obstacles from you advancing the gospel, Satan knows that you know Jesus Christ and that you're in a process of becoming fully saved. Uh, because, by the way, there's three stages of salvation. Salvation step one is saved from the penalty going to hell salvation step two is been you have been sanctified god set you aside to do his work and stage three is glorification you don't get that until you die okay till you get your new body but anyway i don't want to talk about that now but i will talk about that in my salvation video so anyway make sure that you strap your feet up right and that's with the gospel if you notice everything's going back to the bible now the fourth is shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith with which you can distinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. See, this faith saves us and faith heals us, right? Faith isn't something that's static. That means that it's constantly moving. It becomes more beautiful and strong as time goes on. If you're a Christian and you said, for example, you in church service, you, you, you gave your life over to Christ. That's called born again, regen uh, regeneration, right? Now, I call it recycling. That means that we've been recycled from junk, and now God can use us. But we must now get tested and tempted by Satan because we're in the sanctification stage. This is stage here is where we grow. This is where we become disciples, okay? Now, this shield of faith, okay, um, Satan tries to sow doubt. So even though you're in the sanctification stage, you ever notice that when things don't go your way, you it creates some type of doubt in your mind? So what Satan does, he knows that he can't take you from God, but he just wants you to doubt your abilities or your faithfulness to God. See, because if he could do that, he could stop you from from open your mouth. He can stop you from uh, uh, trying to do God's will. So Satan doesn't always try to keep people from crossing over to God's team. He also goes for people that's already on God's team by creating this doubt. So that's why we have to keep this shell of faith. Faith, knowing that God will always come true with what he said in his word. So all faith, which is of Christ, you see, because Christ is the author of and perfecter of all faith. You know, you can go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I, I, um, see, all faith is like a golden shield, precious, solid, and substantial in everything we do. I know it's hard to have faith, but what I tell people now, because it will be hard for me too, but the reason why it's not hard for me, because I study the Bible a lot. I can't live without the Word of God. I can't breathe without the Word of God. I hadn't always been like this, but I am indwelled with the Holy Spirit, okay? The indwelling and the filling over and over. 
when I came to Christ, which all Christians are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, but I, I have to keep myself filled with the Holy Spirit. And the only way you can do that is by constantly feeding the Holy Ghost with the Word of God. Okay? And by doing some works, which James said, faith without works is dead. James did not say works create faith. He did not say works get you saved but he said in order to test your faith see if you're doing any works that'll let you know if you have the real faith or not <clears throat> now this helmet of salvation uh the helmet of salvation protects our head uh our frontal cortex our brain you know what i mean uh keeping the viable excuse me viable and critical parts of our body alive you know, if I cut your head off, you die. Your body will die. Um, um, Satan tried to do that with Jesus. He figured he killed Jesus. There won't be any Christians. If there won't be any Christians, there won't be any marriage at the end. So, so Satan knew what God was up to. And that's why he have always tried to kill followers of Jesus Christ. So, uh, we could say that our way of thinking needs um, preservation. And what, that, what I mean by that is the head is the seat of the mind which when it is laid hold of by the secure understanding of the gospel uh, of hope for eternal life we will not receive false doctrines or give way to Satan temptation I meet so many Christians believe everything they hear and I said well show it to me in the Bible they said well Dr. I ain't got to keep showing you stuff in the Bible I said well up oh, if you don't i'm not gonna believe it and you know they, they get mad at me and walk away but that's okay because see i don't you know i don't pay attention to false doctrine i don't i don't i don't go, you know i won't call their names but they knock on my door some saturdays and they want to try to convince me that what i believe is wrong see it's just like if you was in the air force with me and you got that blue uniform on and you want to be on my buddy's team, let's say the Army and Marines, but yet you want to read out my playbook. I said, well, which one are you? Are you Army and Marines or Air Force? Not that I don't love them, Army Marines, Air Force. I mean, excuse me, Army and Marines. But I am in the Air Force, and that's the team I'm on. So my buddies can convince me that their branch was better than mine. And that's just how we like to have fun within the military. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is you must stand firm on your faith, on your belief. If not, you're going to sway like a tree, like during a storm. And every time somebody knock on your door or talk to you in the hallway, you may think you have to follow what they believe. And I just want to say this. When I go to church service, I see people standing up all the time. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen means... <clears throat> the word is A-M-E-N means that you're in agreement. So when I see people say amen to some junk that came out a preacher or pastor's mouth, it makes me want to vomit. But the reason why they're amening because it sounds spiritual. It has, it's false doctrine. It has no place being spoken of in the house of God. But sometimes they don't even know it's false themselves. They're just going by something they heard. Now, this is not all. I don't want you. I don't want to get the impression that I'm talking about all men of God. But there's a lot out there who wants to make money, and so they they have their pulpit. Uh, so you'll find a lot of that in this prosperity preaching. Uh, it goes on all the time. And I used to try to convince people to stop listening to that false doctrine, but uh, God told me. Leave it alone. He'll take care of it. Six Pete, Sword of the Spirit. Now, what is this Sword of the Spirit? It is the Word of God. It's what I've been talking about. And if you notice, all the pieces uh, refer back to the Word of God. Now, the other pieces of the spiritual armor that we've spoken of so far, there's basically defensive in nature. But now we're talking about the sword, okay? The sword. All you got to do is look at it. What do you think we use a sword for? It is used to be 
defensive and offensive, okay? So if we speak of holiness in the power of the word of God, uh, this weapon is one that we can, you know, when you talk to people about the word of God, we call it pricking. The Holy Ghost pricking that person. But see, that word of God is actually penetrating that soul that God placed in that person when it was conceived in their mother's stomach. Everybody has a piece of God in them. Whether they admit it or not, don't make it not be so. The day that you and I was born, God took that soul off that shelf and put it inside the womb of your mother. I don't want to hear about no mistake. I don't want to hear about your mother say bad things to you. God knew what he was doing. Some women have been raped. And I'm sorry for you. But that child is not a mistake. God don't make mistakes. Some of you out there have been molested. And you say, well, why did God put me on earth to have me go through this? I tell you this. These are some bad things that happen to us. But God, turn it over to God. And God know why he made you. And he know what he wanted to use you for. All you got to do is give in to God. So that sword, that means you must read it and you must go to battle and don't run from people. You got to meet it face to face, hand to hand combat, but not physical, but with the word of God. Let God fight your battles. The seventh piece, the final piece is prayer. Man, man, man. When I went to Desert Storm, actually Desert Shield before Desert Storm, I was with a group of guys and we prayed and prayed and prayed. If you want to see a bunch of guys cry, have them face death. You know, we didn't know what to do. And so I met guys from around the world <clears throat> and women because you see a woman there. See, we prayed and, you know, we got this big thing now where people who hadn't served in the military, they say to us, thank you for your service. God bless. But here in the United States of America, we treat veterans like they're a bunch of crap. We treat veterans like they're nothing. When I was over in the desert, there was a radio station on out of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And they had this sister on the channel said, depart from this military because your country do not like you. And it was that propaganda that was trying to make all military defect. And, you know, we use this uh, tactic many times ourselves as Americans you know, in Vietnam and so forth. But my point is that pray, that prayer, I mean, we all got saved. You know, we didn't know it because after the war was over, we started doing what we always did. But that was the beginning process of being born again. That was all time when God say, stand still and watch me work. And so we all made out alive. Um, we uh, kissed the ground when we got back to the United States. And um, uh, like I said, that was about what, 28, 29 years ago. So, so we cannot ne neglect prayer because it means that we're trying to draw on spiritual strength, all spiritual strength from God. You know, without prayer, uh, you know, it's kind of like we're trying to rely to do things without God. And all efforts uh, on any spiritual warfare is empty futile so we must put on the full arm of god which is truth righteousness the gospel faith salvation the word of god and prayer now these are the tools these are all spiritual tools only one offense is the sword which i love that i love that bible a lot of people say don't hit me in the head with the bible i say well i'm not gonna hit you in the head with the bible the words may but i'm not gonna cast any stones on you okay so anyway, God has given us to which we have a spiritual vi victory overcome Satan's attack and temptations. So in closing, I want to thank you for being here. I know, uh, actually, I went longer than I wanted to go. But uh, when I open my mouth, I just let the Holy Ghost talk. So I want to thank you for being patient with me. Uh, again, uh, my name is Dr. Moore. Uh, and I would love to continue doing what I'm doing, but I need your help. If you feel as though God is moving you to uh, giving me a donation, please send your donation to Dr. Carlos and Moore, P. 
P.O. Box 871, Sefner, Florida, 33583. Um, and I can accept checks or money orders. Don't send cash. You know, they got some crooked people working in the post office. Not all of them now. I don't want anybody sending me in the hate mail. But, you know, crooked people are everywhere. And so uh, the best thing to help me out is a check or, or money order. And um, go to my website. Uh, I got a website called DrSeymour.com. And on this website, I have this uh, urge to start helping kids in school too. The teenagers that's been pushed aside. In Florida right now, boy, I think we rank number 45, you know, as the the, the lowest rating school in, in America. Uh, and so I got to do something about that. If you want to buy purchase any of my books, you can go to lulu.com and uh, feel free to buy anything that you see. So once again, thank you. And I hope you tune in for the, my next series.